Hello, and welcome to a conversation with Adrian Hill. This is part of my video interview series with science communicators and skeptical activists for my Skeptical Inquirer online column. I'm so glad that we finally made this happen. Adrian, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So yeah. to let the viewers know, this is actually the second time I'm interviewing you, right? The first was for an audio only audience, though. I interviewed you at Psycon 2022, a year ago, for the Skeptic Zone, with the introduction that I just met somebody here who may be familiar to Skeptic Zone listeners. So for people who don't know, why would I have said that? <laughs> well, for over two years, believe it or not, I have been a regular part of the Skeptic Zone podcast as a reporter, and I have my own little segment called, you can, I'm going to mess this up again. Richard will get so mad at me. You can count on Adrian. I can't picture Richard getting mad. He's such a, <laughs> such a mellow personality. Oh, he'll just shake his head, right? Oh, here she goes again. <laughs> That's Richard getting mad. Yeah. <laughs> I have a terrible time remembering names, even things that I'm involved with. So I, I quite often get those things wrong. So yeah, I have a, a bit called You Can Count on Adrian. And it's a little bit of a reference because I'm a hired, hired, I'm a retired high school mathematics teacher. And, you know, counting math, it's a really bad joke. And shortly after I started doing that segment, Richard asked me if I would be interested in reading the Australian Skeptics newsletter every two weeks. And I have been doing that for two years now. Let's come back to the details of that a little later. I want to go a little bit further back. So besides doing the Skeptic Zone work now, you're an active member of Susan Gerbic's Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia project. You're yes, also a skeptical author, and you gave your first PsyCon talk just a few months ago. A very productive skeptical activist, indeed. Well, so, I'm getting there. It's getting busy. It's It's... <laughs> Fun. It's actually quite fun in my retirement. I've got a new career happening, I guess. Yes. So let's go back in time uh, a little bit to learn how you got into all of this in the first place. And just like they do in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, let's do your origin story. Oh. So first, were you always a skeptic? Um, I like to think yes and no, if that makes sense. I grew up in a secular family with a secular family who did they really prized science. So my dad's very mathematical. I guess that's kind of where I get it from. And they really focused on sort of discovery learning when I was growing up, for example, Santa Claus. You know, they, they when I discovered that Santa Claus wasn't a thing, they, I just asked questions and they just said, what do you think? Do you think this is reasonable? So that was very typical in our family doesn't believe that or doesn't mean that there weren't some interesting ideas that you know would happen with regards to things they would read and in the newspaper and absolutely believe for sure that that would happen but we didn't have the same amount of information either right they believed the newspapers for things like ghosts they didn't believe in ghosts they even though I have a ghost story that you can listen to on Skeptoid and they, so I just grew up in that sort of, think about it. Do you think this could really happen? And I had a lot of religious friends when I was growing up, and they would do that same sort of thing. Well, if you want to go to church, go for it. But just think about what you're hearing. And, and so I kind of was raised like that. Went to university, was in science, and I did take some critical thinking in university. That was my first exposure to some of that. And carried on with my life and did fall into some pseudoscience along the way. Uh, which, which ones in particular? Naturop naturopathy. So I took my youngest son to a naturopath in the 90s on a recommendation from a friend because he had very, very severe asthma and allergies. And I was very afraid of putting a two-year-old on antihistamines that said, do not give to a kid under 12. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> yeah. So I, and the, at that time, specialists seemed to be very abrupt. Anyone that I went to my, for myself and for my kids, I've really noticed a big change in that over the years. And all he said to me when I questioned that was, well, you have no choice. 
<laughs> so, you know, for me, that wasn't a good enough answer. And of course, I went to a naturopath on allergist and they were very convincing. And I asked for evidence. I said, where are your studies? Show me the efficacy of this. Why have I not heard of this before? And she says, well, it comes from China. <laughs> and here's, here's our studies. And of course, they're all written in another language. So I can't verify anything. Did they but object at all to you even asking? Because most people oh, don't ask those things when they go to medical professionals. Not, not at all. They, they were very open in my mind. They were very convincing, very charismatic. It was a woman. She, she knew how to talk to me. And so we started my son on this regiment of awful things <laughs> and what's really interesting is the allergist actually told me that when a kid is so allergic at such a young age as they head into puberty it often goes into remission and so he was on this natural path stuff and we did two things he got older and when you move to another location the allergens are different so the allergies went away and I always thought, okay, there's, it could be the natural path stuff worked. It could be, he's getting older and it could be because we moved. And so I knew that it was possible that their medic, this medication, these treatments may not have had an effect because, and as I now, no, it probably didn't because, you know, we know a lot more about that whole process, the, the natural path. So and, what, were they giving you homeopathic remedies? No, I, uh, they gave me something called APIS, which is still, uh, well, maybe it is homeopathic because it is in homeopathic remedies, this APIS, as if I remember correctly. I mean, that's 1990s, right? I told you, sometimes I don't know names. I don't remember names very well. And the other thing was stinging nettle and so we had these sort of spiky little dried up pieces of herb that we would spread on toast and put under peanut butter because you love peanut butter oh that's not homeopathic that's real maybe that's real stuff. herbal herbal stuff yeah. and, <laughs> and those were the the treatments and the thing that makes me really angry is at that time we you know i had two children at the time and they were young and we had no money we were, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, barely, and we weren't going out for dinner. We, we, we couldn't do anything. And here I was spending a lot of money on at what, in my view, on a homeopath or not a homeopath, a natural path. But I was a desperate parent. It's the typical story. Desperate parent needing, wanting to help my kid who was suffering and so that was my foray into that world. I also got into essential oils for a little while. <laughs> Again, when my kids were young, it's, it's amazing how long this stuff has been around, right? You think it's a lot of the younger folk may think that this is all new. No, 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 no. This has been around forever. And that lasted a few months before I started thinking, what? <laughs> So, so during, during, before you became uh, involved in the skeptical movement, you, you're a math teacher. Correct. Right. So that gives you some background in, you know, logic, at least the logic of math and that sort of thing and thinking things through as opposed to just accepting anything. So that's a good start. It is very much. That, and I think yeah. you're insulated in that world too. You're in a science department or a math department and the yeah. math and science often get together. So you don't tend to be exposed to a lot of pseudoscience when you're in yeah. those groups, which insulated me a little bit to what the world really was like out there about things like believe in ghosts and i guess that can bring me to finding susan gerbeck yeah that was what it's been <laughs> gonna talk about the gorilla skeptics project so that was your first foray into the world of skeptical activism it was yes and so it was where, over... where did you hear about susan gerbeck's project i heard about her project through david gorski's science-based medicine article called the null hypothesis because of my math background of course i naturally gravitated to it as math plus medicine what what can you it can't be better <laughs> we can't but that was it. about gary null wasn't it it was about gary null i joined after reading the article about 
Gary Null attacking David Gorski, Susan Gerbeck, and one other person who I think may have been Stephen Novella, but that may be incorrect. And there was some article he had posted. And in this article that David Gar Gorski wrote, he talked about the guerrilla skeptics on Wikipedia, and I'd never heard of, heard of that organization. And the leader, Susan Gerbeck, was mentioned, and it sounded, even though he quoted from her website, and it sounded fun. It sounded like this was going to be a fun organization to work with. And so I immediately reached out to Susan Gerbeck via her website. And within 40 minutes, I had a reply and she was laughing, going, oh, my goodness, wouldn't it be amazing if Gary Null could find out that he found me a Wikipedia editor? <laughs> <laughs> and... uh, I have to tell you, I had a similar uh, connection initially with uh, Susan. I was reading, I, I think I heard her or maybe it was another person on the team being interviewed on some podcast, perhaps Skeptical. Skeptical. <laughs> could, have, and could have been that one. Yes. Could have been the skeptic zone. It could have been skepticality. Right. Those two come to mind. Cause I, I know that she was mentioned on both of those. Um, and I looked her up much like you did. And the first thing I found was, and like astrology is com, something like that what was a website bitching about Susan Garbick and the gorilla skeptics. I said, Oh, I'm joining this organization. <laughs> so it's, these people, if they knew how many editors they get by picking on the organization, exactly. they would stop, but gladly they don't know. <laughs> well, and they give her a lot of credit, a lot of superpowers. I mean, she is a superwoman, but. You know, <laughs> All does... right. So for those who don't even know what gorilla skepticism on Wikipedia is, can you uh, give a little synopsis? We're a group of editors who edit Wikipedia, particularly in science and science communication type topics, including fringe topics, which includes the pseudoscience, some of the pseudoscience we were talking about. So ghosts, homeopathy, naturopathy, uh, UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them now. Uh, also, I want to call them UFOs, but NASA disagrees. <laughs> thought I'd throw it in there. So, and also medical, like anti-vax type of things. So we're trying to make sure that all those pages have really good sources, that they're well done and as accurate as we can make them at, at the this, for this day with good sourcing. And Susan trains you to be able to edit on Wikipedia without getting your edits reverted, most likely. Now, sometimes they do, as we both know. And knowing the rules is really critical to getting your information to stick. And sourcing is really critical. Good, reliable sources, secondary sources is super important. And it's a great project. Oh, and it's done in a lot of different languages. So right. what's, what, what is the impact? Does anybody ever actually read Wikipedia, Adrian? <laughs> well, the impact, I was, a, that was one of the first things I really noticed, I think, belonging to this group, because there's something called Stat Badger that tracks our edits or our pages that we've either rewritten at least 50% of or completely started from scratch. And then it goes into something called Stat Badger and it trademarked by Kyle Polich, by the way, the it data does. skeptic who created that for us. Yeah. So check out his podcast too. The data and, skeptic. Yes. And so we get these um, stats about the pages that we've created or redone. My very first project was Haunted House. And that's when I started to realize there was this world outside of my little insular science and math world where people do actually believe in ghosts. My impression was ghosts are part of movies. They're fun to think about. They're fun to read and imagine. Oh, you really were in a bubble. Oh my God. I, I think if you look so at surveys, it's like 50% of people at least believe. In it's, it's, I believe in Canada, it's 46%. In Alberta, it is over 50%. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> and I afterwards found out I have a family member who believes in ghosts. So I just didn't know it. I was just, it's just not something we talked about. So I was unaware that other 
people and cultures actually believe pretty strongly in ghosts. So that was fascinating to me. And so my project, I, I, I really took it on and did a deep dive into haunted houses and found out about worldwide haunted houses. And that was sort of the start of that interest because I've done spirit photography and I've done Winchester Mystery House and Sarah Winchester. So I kind of went down this ghostly, ghostly rabbit hole. But the and and by, that, just by, let me make clear by, you said you did it or you, you, what that means is you found a page, which was like not really well written, not constructed, right. didn't have the right citations. Maybe it was a stub and you, you did all the research and then greatly expanded it to, it's a right. really good looking page. Thank Well, I, I hope they are. I mean, it's as well written as a math teacher can write them. I mean, that, that's, what's great about Wikipedia is other people come in and correct your grammar and spelling. Right. So <laughs> one of the good things about the Gorilla Skeptics project is we work as a team and help each other out. Right. So you have yeah. people review it and, you know, yeah. give their input too. So yeah, you're not alone. And that's, what's great too. You don't feel you're not, don't have those same kind of, well, I kind of was nervous, but you don't have the same level of nerves publishing yeah. to Wikipedia because you know, a team has looked out for you. To begin with right and if something happens like you do get an edit reverted by another editor then you can go back to the team and say okay did i do something wrong here yeah. what what would you suggest yeah. yeah or was is this person in the wrong especially when you're right. new that's very that's intimidating right. and within i think it was like a month or maybe three months six months something like that i had fifty thousand views on that one page and it's been up since 2020 and i think it's getting close to 700,000 views now. Uh, yeah, so that's just on one page. I mean, how many times all my social media combined, my views is probably un under like a thousand. <laughs> that's probably an exaggeration too, but still. And the Winchester Mystery House page, when I redid that page, uh, there ended up being a little bit of an edit war happening between not me because one one of the things Susan kind of says is post your page and then just let the process work and it turned out there were people from the Winchester Mystery House that were not happy that I was correcting <laughs> the the lore that was surrounding Sarah Winchester and for people who don't know what is the what is this mystery house the oh this uh Winchester Mystery House is in San Jose, California, and it is often touted as being the most haunted house in North America or even the world sometimes. There there's been movie a movie written about her that was based on the lore, not on the truth. There are countless shows on like ghost hunting shows on those dubious channels that go and in investigate the Winchester Mystery House. And it's a tourist attraction. And it became a tourist attraction was it nine months or six months after she died. And it has been a tourist attraction ever since. And that was in 2022, or not, not 2022, 1922, I believe is when it became uh, an attraction. So it just celebrated its 100th year as a tourist attraction last year. And, and another thing you've been involved, just to jump a little ahead here in skepticism, yeah. is that you you told the PsyCon audience, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiries Conference in Las Vegas, from the stage all about the false news, the you know fake news fake about news. this house, right? In your first yeah. presentation at PsyCon. It was. It was about uh, Sally Winchester, because that's what she was called all her life, even though she is called Sarah Winchester in most literature, as well as on the tours for the Winchester Mystery House. And yeah, so I, I had to submit a paper, <laughs> which was fun. And having written the Wikipedia page made that fairly easy, though it's still a little intimidating having to pull together a lot of information and narrow it down to a topic for you're supposed to speak for 15 minutes, which that's the big challenge was limiting what information I was going to include because there's a lot there's a lot of lore and what's I think really interesting about it is it did start while she was alive so this is not something that was created after she died this these rumors many of them started while she was alive which makes it I think even more interesting so how did you become a speaker at PsyCon Well, I applied. So they put, put out a call for the Sunday papers and you put out a 
I guess it's just like a draft, right? Like, a, this is my idea. These are the resources I'm going to use. And this is what it's about. This is what I'm going to call it. And you send it in and they review it. And then you either don't make it past that point or you get selected to carry on to the next level. And that's when I had to write my paper and wrote my paper, submitted it. And you have to write the paper just so you know, as if it's for a Skeptical Inquirer magazine. So citations have to be included. And I use, luckily I've written, I think it was two articles for Skeptical Inquirer by then. So it wasn't too bad. I, you know, I kind of knew what I had to do. So, cause we only had, what was it like a week or something to write the paper? Yeah, it was a short time. Yeah, it was a short time. And then they review it and say yes or no. And I got a yes. So that was really exciting. And I was going anyway, so <laughs> it was it was great. Because one of the things, if you're on the Sunday papers, is they don't pay you anything for it. They don't pay your way there. You have to look after that yourself. But I was already going. I'd already booked my tickets. I, I booked my flights. So it was just a really great chance for me to stand in front of that audience at that podium, which was a little surreal, I have to admit. It was very cool. It was, it was pretty, pretty exciting. So you mentioned there that you also wrote for the Skeptical Choir even before that paper. How did that? What was it? What was your path to getting to the Psycon stage? And by the way, to the Skeptic Zone. The, the first thing you did was the Grill of Skeptics. So that yes. was a foot in the door to yes. the Skeptic World, correct? You met so Susan Gerbic. You made yeah. other contacts. Yeah. Well, Susan Gerbic kind of opens up the whole world to you, right? Is it, once you know Susan Gerbic yeah. and you get working with her, it, it, you can just stay doing that just that kind of science communication, just doing mm -hmm. Wikipedia editing. But if you want to go further, she will help you. It's it's pretty amazing. It's absolutely an amazing foot in the door to do, you know, if you want to contribute more, it's yeah. the way to do that, right? Yeah. You can you can stay anonymous as a Gorilla Skeptics editor and make a huge impact, as Adrian was talking about her, you know, stats on the pages she works on. Um or you well, can before, take that before we go that. there. I just pulled up my recent stats. What's I'm almost to? two million. <laughs> I'm at uh, one point nine million. That uh, is point, incredible. One million nine hundred and thirty thousand four hundred and fifty two. For those who like to be precise. <laughs> and and just a little more about the Gorilla Skeptics project. So once Susan trains you, like she has a list of what she's interested. In. Other Gorilla Skeptics editor team people will put. Hey, has anyone looked at this? But you can also work on anything you want. Right. So oh, I've done lots of other edits. Right. You bet. I, right. I've done it for hockey right. players. Right. It's a great way to get trained in how you can effectively yep. edit Wikipedia and help out in scientist skepticism, but also work on whatever you want. So, all right. So, you know, you you were a guerrilla skeptics editor and you went to a conference, as I, as I assume. That's the first other foot in the door, right? Yeah, that's where I met you. Yeah, that's where we met. Yeah, you, we met. You were Banachek's shill. You went up on stage and pretended you were under his spell somehow i still don't get how you did that i, I have no idea because i had my eyes closed the whole time i don't know <laughs> it was <laughs> he said move left and you moved the, the other person on the other stage you were physically no like not physically and... connected to because uh, he was your soulmate or something like yeah, that yeah. you were swaying he was swaying it's like it was amazing yeah it was pretty funny yeah he was uh <laughs> So, yeah. so at, at that conference you got to see the other speakers and make contacts mm -hmm. i don't know is that when you met richard no, he was not at that conference. Ah, um, all right. So tell the story of when you, how did you get to be a contributor to the Skeptic Zone podcast? Well, I think it's the pandemic actually that allowed that to happen because when everything shut down, the, one of the first things Susan did when we realized things weren't opening up very quickly is she started an online trivia game, which still is happening. It was supposed to be one night and it turned into, I don't know what we're at. We're all close to 200 trivia games now. And in that she opened it up to everybody and lots of people who are fairly well known joined trivia. One was Richard Saunders. I know Brian Dunning's been there a few times uh, Adam Adam uh, Berenst Beren, uh, Berenstein is that how you say his last name? I'm terrible with names. The, not sure uh, what you mean there. Not Adam Evan Berenstein, who <laughs> 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 uh, who looks like Adam Savage. So you know I get the two. He right absolutely <laughs> does, especially with the beard. 
I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, such a, a a lovely man. We've been in contact a few. Yeah, times. so he's from the from uh, the uh, skeptics, the guide, skeptics to the guide to the universe. universe. You're right, Evan Bernstein, which is one of the first. Well, which was the first skeptical podcast I regularly me, listen. Uh, absolutely, me too. Yeah, so uh, I'll see. Ross Blocker has also joined. Uh, yes. Once. Uh, he, yeah, he I has. Think Celestia did. I'm not positive. About I don't. That. I'm not sure about Celestia, yeah. but possibly. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. been lots of uh, people who will pop in and go, oh, yeah. this yeah. is pretty cool. So Richard was pretty regular. And then he made an announcement about the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. And I because I knew nothing about the psychic world. Again, I was in this little bubble. I just thought people went on a lark. It was fun. It was entertainment. You know, like nobody believes in that. How could somebody believe in that? (laughs) And so I thought, I got to find out more about this. And I volunteered and I don't think I missed many weeks. And it went on for like a year and a half, almost two years where we met weekly. And during that time, uh, Richard asked me if I would write about being on that project for the Australian Skeptic magazine. And it was shortly, oh, and also another thing happened is I did a Skept Talk virtually with Susan Gerbeck for her Skeptic Camp. And it was about Tourette syndrome because I have, that's another little thing I do to volunteer my time. <laughs> it's his work with the Tourette OCD Alberta Network. I'll give them a little plug. If you want to find out more about Tourette syndrome, OCD, check that website out. Just Google it, Tourette OCD Alberta Network, it will come up. Because I'm not giving the URL, it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's through the University of Calgary and it's you know, got lots of, lots of letters. And so Richard was also presenting and he heard my talk. And so he asked to interview me about Tourette syndrome for the podcast. That was my first time on the podcast. I believe, oh, there was one other time where he talked to us a little bit when we were doing the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, but I was pretty quiet. I didn't say too much. But when he interviewed me, that was really something. And he walked me through how to go through it. I had no idea. And then he asked me to do an advertisement. And then I think I bought a microphone. (laughs) And he talked me through it, like, you know, how do you do this? And and then he asked me, or maybe I got the microphone and asked me after he asked me to do the regular bit, the counting on Adrian bit. Then the newsletter, and here I am. And it's been a couple of years, and I've been able to interview some pretty cool people. It, and we found, you know, we discover people, which is really fun, like Kat McLeod up in Edmonton. You know, I met her at a conference, found her story absolutely enthralling. And so she's been on, I think, three segments with me now, and she's doing great. She's, she's another one, I think, another skeptical activist in the making. Well, and that's the other thing that I thought was really amazing, because I don't consider myself to be a writer at all, you know, and, and being a math. I, I went into math, so I didn't have to write. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the irony of the whole situation, here I am writing a whole lot, lot of articles. I was asked to review or write a synopsis of, it was supposed to be four speakers at PsyCon this last year, this last, um, the last PsyCon, that's what I'm trying to say, the last conference. And then I went to, Richard Wiseman's, Massimo Polidoro's, and Raymond Hall's magic workshop, which was unbelievably fun and informative and just a blast. So if you ever have a chance to go to workshops at PsyCon, they're so fun. And I ran into the new editor for Skeptical Inquirer, Stephen Hupp, at that evening and I was telling him what a great thing it was. And he says, oh, I didn't, wasn't able to find anybody to write about that. Would you do that? <laughs> so five. <laughs> and if you want, I, I really think it's officially, is it seven or eight? Eight, I think. I'm not good at math, apparently. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was the four, yeah, so seven. Uh, the four people before and then the three people from the workshop. So uh, I, I hear, I don't know, it's. Hopefully it's okay. I'm always questioning. I never feel like it's really possible that this is me. <laughs> so what do we call that? Uh, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I have a lot of that. 
And I think the worst was when I was co-chair for our first conference here in Calgary called Western Canadian Reason Conference. Or we, we can... can reason. Yeah. Yeah. Very clever. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun. And I chair that with um Jenna Lee Morris. So oh, good grief. See, there's that name thing again, that name block. And I've known her for years. So Jenna Lee and I are co-chairing. She's really the person who really wanted to do this. And she just said, hey, Adrian, will you help me out? So I, I am co-chair, but really it's it's Jenna Lee's dream. And we were going to just do local speakers to start out with. And I was going to be one of them. And this was before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit. So it was delayed three years. And we finally had it this year in 2023 in May. And the lineup just kind of kept getting better. And there was Aaron Raw was one of the first people we got. We were supposed to get Matt Dillahunty, but he had to cancel at the last minute. And through him, we got Seth Andrews. <laughs> and then Richard Saunders <laughs> ended up coming. And so from being mostly local speakers, and he, I was still on the agenda, I just thought, I don't belong here. I really felt like I didn't belong on that list of fabulous speakers. And I really had to talk to myself and go, I've been on the skeptic zone for by then it was <laughs> close to two years. I've been doing this work with Susan since... 2018 or 2019 you know I've done these three written articles <laughs> you know, I tried to really really talk myself into doing it and I'm really glad I did because it was again a really great experience getting up in front of that's what I do I'm a teacher right I get up in front of people and I talk and it was a great experience it was it was nerve-wracking <laughs> Because as I say, there's that imposter syndrome. I don't belong with these people. And it was, but it was great. It was a really, really fantastic experience. I mean, I think that these people, you know, atheists, skeptics, when they get together, you have something in common, you think the same. It's just fun. It's just fun getting together with your people. Which was more nerve wracking, that or standing on the stage at Saigon? To be honest, the week in reason was more nerve wracking. That's that's fascinating. And the only reason that that is true is because it was the first time I'd stood in front of a live audience since before the pandemic. Okay. And, and that I, was before the Psycon one. So the, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So because it was the first time, it's like, have I lost my skill? Right. I, I've been public speaking since 2004 or 2005, a long time. And that was for the Tourette syndrome stuff that I've done. I've done professional development days. I've done so much public speaking on that topic for years. And so it's not like it was a new thing for me. And that's again, why that feeling of not belonging was kind of false. If you, if you really rationally look at it, but that feeling didn't go away until after the fact. <laughs> and yeah, that, that, I have talked to so many people about that who, who mm -hmm. wind, wind up being, you know, fairly well-known people in any field. And they often feel that way for quite a long time. Yeah. 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 Uh, you'd think that after that many years, since 20, uh, 2005, that I'd be over it. It's almost 20 years of public speaking, plus over 30 years of teaching in front of a high school kids. Right? So it, it makes no sense. Our brains don't make sense. I've learned that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, when I, when I uh, sort of got the job because I volunteered for it, for doing the video interviews of the, the speakers for the conference, and I kind of got access to people I would never think I would get more than a hello to if I ever met them at a conference, and I get yeah. to talk to them for an hour. You know, it's like, you know, wow, how did I get here? You know, yeah. Bill, Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Dawkins. It's like very freaky. Unbelievable. It's, Unbelievable. It's a very freaky feeling. And, you know, like I said, it all goes back to joining the guerrilla skeptics. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a different path than you did, but it's still all because of that. Yeah. And, you know, getting in Susan's sphere and getting introduced to people and uh, yeah. taking on other things. Yeah. And, and yeah, as I say, you don't have to, but yeah. if you want to, yeah. there's there's lots of room. We need people. We need more people doing this kind of work. 
And it's important to work. It's important to fight back. I, I love the idea that skepticism is consumer protection. Absolutely. I think that's a really good way to look at it. You know, right, we're not especially talking... when you get into the things of, you know, the vaccine denial and things like that, yeah. uh, as you talked about naturopathy and all the other alternative medicine uh, things, which convince people not to take real medicine. Yeah. Yeah, I've had people, including psychologists, you know, because my kids have had lots of issues. So I've enlisted experts and I had one, she was quite young and I hope I've educated her a little bit. But she made the comics, I expressed my anger against natural paths. And she said, but it helps people, you know, even if it's even if it's the placebo effect. And I just said, you know, I'm really angry about that because when I was young and couldn't afford it, I spent money that really put us in debt to take my kid to a natural path. And that makes me angry. And I want to protect others who are in that same situation from doing the same thing. And she kind of sat back and went, oh, I mean, not even talking about not going and getting the proper medical attention, which is another issue with going yeah. to a natural path. They go there first yeah. instead of seeking the proper uh, medical attention. But just the financial one, she could understand that. And I think most people can understand that that argument that if you're paying a lot of money for something that's not going to work except make you believe it works right that's, that's a problem for most people and yeah, so, that, so that, that that's why this movement is very important and not just to convince people that you know there's no evidence for ghosts or psychics really working <laughs> but even i mean people will say well what's the harm of ghosts and if you read ben radford and kenny biddle's pieces there's a lot of harm. People leave their houses because they believe they're haunted and they get a psychic come in and say, yes, I felt the spirits, they're evil. And then they pay to, or so they move out of the house or sell the house. That's harmful. That's yeah. and money. Huh. Again. It's, it's disruptive. So there's harms there too, for sure. And I think that's been shown and you can correct me if I'm wrong with this, but this is based on what I've seen at Psychon over the over the years is that you know that if you the more conspiracy or pseudoscience you believe the more harmful it gets and it's more likely you're going to fall into the next one yeah and absolutely yeah i think it's it's problematic so we need to battle all pseudoscience we shouldn't just say oh these ones aren't important anymore they're all important right um flat earth is one well how could people believe in flat earth People do. It's probably extreme minority, but the problem is those people also believe in every other conspiracy you can think of. Exactly. QAnon is a big one, right? That they're part of. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can end it there, although I could talk to you for hours on these subjects. Thank you for joining me today, Adrian. Well, thanks for having me, Rob. It's always a pleasure talking with you anytime.